town of Duns on the border between England and Scotland was once home to the late great Jim Clark. It proudly displays the mementos of its most famous son. From his first trophies won in rallies and driving tests to victories in Grand Prix and the Indy 500. Clark is now also commemorated by the only British Championship round in mainland Britain to be run on country roads close to the public. Round four of the Mobile One British Rally Championship, the Sayat Jim Clark Memorial Rally. Perfect rally country for the 24 times special stages on the back roads around the town. Close to traffic just 30 minutes before the first rally car and reopened just after the last. First car off the ramp, the Vauxhall Astra of Mark Higgins and Brian Thomas, the leading Formula Two runners, but 10 points behind series leader Marco Epati at half distance in the series. Higgins was well aware of the need to get maximum points this time. But while Higgins was already pushing hard, the man behind him was pushing even harder. His Vauxhall teammate, Neil Weirden, co-driven by Trevor Agnew, won his first British Championship event on similar terrain last year in Ulster. Now he was setting a spectacular pace as the shadows lengthened and the first leg of 10 special stages headed into the night. But last year's winner and reigning champion Tapio Laukonen was in spectacular form too. This pace allowed Laukonen briefly to take the lead from Weirden on the third stage, only for the Lancastrian to snatch it back. And another Volkswagen Golf was flying high too. Jock Armstrong from Dumfries, but he'd be delayed when the wheel nuts later came loose on his ex Alistair McRae Volkswagen Golf. This was Yamo Kutaleto's first rally on the asphalt with the Hyundai Coupe, but a down on power engine meant he was giving away over 30 horsepower to its Volkswagen and Vauxhall opposition. <laughs> And for teammate Andrew Pinker, it was his first experience ever of rallying on the asphalt. On the earliest stages, the man from Perth in Western Australia was on the steepest part of his learning curve, sliding off no less than three times. In comparison, Justin Dale was using all his experience. Watch the tyre marks at the top of the screen. Oh, nice. Now you can guess who made them on the pre-rally recce. On the opening loop of stages, Dale in the Peugeot 106 GTI was in fifth overall, leading the fiercely fought Ferodo Super 1600s. Nice, and left three, and right three, and left two into right one, long gravel over bumps. 100, left one, 150, left two, and flat crest maybe, 80, crest, breaking 50, Left four. Dale needed all of his corner cutting skills though to stay ahead of a close pack pursuit. Heading the pack teammate David Higgins in his Peugeot less than 20 seconds behind after five stages and he was demonstrating how much later the lightweight 1600 cars can break than their two litre equivalents. Matt Sanderson and Claire Mole in the Proton were determined to keep their 10 point class lead as they headed to Langton Mill. As always a hit with the media and over 4,000 spectators. to left one at junction, slippy. 50, crest to left five, 120. But if there was a favorite with the fans, it was the Citroen Saxo, spectacularly driven by the Ulsterman, Neil McShay. And a brand new shape too in the Super 1600s, a development run for the brand new works Ford Puma making a return to the driver's seat, 1998 champion Martin Rowe. Johnny Milner in the production class Toyota was hoping for a change in his miserable luck this season, but in vain. Look at the right rear tyre. An innocuous enough looking puncture, but as he continued, the heat from the asphalt triggered a fireworks display from the magnesium alloy rim. <laughs> And then suddenly there was silence on the Edrum special stage, except for the sounds of emergency vehicles. Milner's year 2000 title challenge had come to a spectacular end. The burning magnesium alloy wheel had set light to the entire car. And having exhausted his fire extinguisher, those of the marshals and several other crews, Milner and some brave spectators were now using buckets of water to cool the fuel tank and keep it from exploding. Nearly. Even Milner was running out of ideas this time. Because that can't put it out, can it? 
The local volunteer fire brigade had broken a few records themselves in getting to the scene, but even their help couldn't save the stricken £100,000 Toyota. Milner and co-driver Nicky Beach could only count themselves as lucky in having escaped unscathed in the nick of time. A specialist aircraft crash frame had to be used to eventually bring the blaze under control. But by then, the car on which Milner had pinned his year 2000 title hopes was a burned-out hulk. Just ran a touch wide over a, a, a jump left. Just I felt it just touched the bank on the right. But I thought, oh well, you know, it's just a just a hard landing, no problem. And then every every left hander, it was I could just feel it just starting to break at the back a little bit, as if it got a soft back tyre. So I thought, well, okay, every time I turn left, it should be a bit canny. And we'll be all right. How far to go, Nicky? Three miles, no problem. Got here like a mile from the end of the stage, and suddenly it was it wasn't just tyre tyre smoke inside the car. It was proper smoke. I was amazed, I was distraught to say the least, but anyway, I mean, we've, we've saved the engine, I mean, the body shell's jiggered now, but <laughs> I'm past crying now. Scrap that one, on it? Milner's Toyota may have become scorched earth history, but the battle for the production class for non-factory amateur drivers was just beginning to hot up. Lancastrian Neil Simpson had been cruelly robbed of victory on the Scottish Rally by a technical irregularity. Here, though, he was proving his pace was no fluke, heading the class for the four-wheel drive turbo cars by nine seconds after five stages. Marco Epati, the leader of the Mobile One British Rally Championship, had decided the big heavy Mitsubishi couldn't win here, but a mistake could easily lose him the championship. Therefore, as in Scotland, he was pacing himself in 10th place, happy to stay the distance and pick up the points. A unique feature of the Jim Clark Rally is that each of the two legs starts in the evening and runs into the night. And maybe Justin Dale's spotlights are going to be used to illuminate those shortcuts again. Well, you've got to try and find every little shortcut you can, really, with these cars. Um, just after that, you're just sort of holding it on the rev limiter in sixth gear and I sort of looked across at Andrew and he sort of put my hand up and he goes, keep both hands on the wheel, will you? I think he's a bit scared, but uh, no, it's, you, you've got to try and do them sort of cuts like that. Similar preparations at Vauxhall would allow the same pace in darkness as well as daylight for rally leader Neil Weirden. It's, it's feeling very, very good. The car's fantastic. Um, I'm really enjoying it. And the surprising thing, I'm not taking too many risks and the times are coming, so I'm feeling very confident. But, uh, you know, it's very early on in the rally, and obviously the last rally we did the Scottish, I was a minute and 20 up, and, and it all went to pot, so until that fat lady's singing her head off, then I'm, I'm not going to worry too much. Five more stages to go before the overnight or early morning rest halt, and still three quarters of the rally left. Yeah, out yet. Weirden's lead was just eight seconds from Laukonen, and anything that could happen probably would. Weirden's excursion into the field will lose him over two minutes and the rally lead. You get on the horn. Should keep going. Go. Nice cam. Weirden's problems weren't over yet. The dive through the hedge had wiped off the light pods, and even the best headlamps on main beam aren't up to rallying speeds. Weirden's answer was to allow Andrew Pinker to pass, then use him as a pathfinder. Yeah, well. Come on, come on, come on, come on! Go, right two and left one. And left six long, 50. Right four plus. 
The bizarre tail chase meant, though, that Weirden wasn't losing any more time. He was down to 12th, but already planning his fight back. This, though, would be the last we'd see of Matt Anderson and Claire Mole in the Proton. To right one up, don't cut. What's that? The Battle of the 1600s, though, was as spectacular as ever, with Neil McShay getting the Splash of the Day award at Langton Ford, then taking a bow. Even despite this spin, the spectacular Ulsterman's pace was keeping him close behind the two Peugeots, which were still fighting for the class lead. David Higgins was now up to fifth place overall. And ahead of him, the class leader Justin Dale, brake disc red hot, was in fourth place. And remember that shortcut? It worked just as well in the dark. 150. Right four, big cut. And left three of the bumps. And left four. 80. Right one into left four. But all wasn't well for the new rally leader. Tapio Laukonen's golf was jammed in second gear. The Finn would lose almost 50 seconds in the rally lead, dropping to third, but he didn't seem too downhearted. We had a gear shifting problem, but then uh, after this stage we managed to fix it on the road section, so uh, uh, it's a shame, it's always a disappointment to lose uh, quite a lot of time, but luckily it was uh, only two, two uh, short stages. Into second place as a result, Yama Kutaleto was proving that what the Hyundai was losing in pace down the straights, it was capable of pulling back around the corners. We have been driving all the time, no, no problems, and uh, I think we, we go nearly the limit. It's, uh, <laughs> some stages are too quick. The tight and twisty stages seem to suit the car. Yes, when it's, when it's tight and twisty and narrow, then the times are very good. But as the red-eyed crews headed back to Duns for the rest halt, Mark Higgins and the Vauxhall Astro are heading the field, the third leader in as many hours as the Sayat Jim Clark rally lived up to its reputation. Higgins the leader by a slender 43-second margin from the two Finns and the two giant killing Peugeots. Quite difficult now because we've got sort of quite a good lead, so we've got to keep our concentration up for all of tomorrow. But anything can happen. Look what's happened in the last two stages, and there's a hell of a long way to go yet. Three, two, one. Sixty right, three plus. One hundred to five. Higgins knew there was still a long way to go. This was only the eleventh of twenty-four special stages, and there was another overnight loop to come and the top four front-wheel drive cars were all covered by just two turn minutes. Unseen, left two. Eight, turn unseen, left two. 250, to care. Straight jump, good. 450. In contrast to the howling Formula 2 cars, the performance of Neil Simpson's Mitsubishi was almost serene silence but it belied his pace. In sixth place, he was now just five seconds behind David Higgins' Peugeot. Simpson was now over a minute clear of his nearest production class rival, Guy Anderson, in his Mitsubishi. But the Buckinghamshire driver was now in 10th overall, ahead of Marco Epati, as the championship leader kept true to his promise of maintaining a steady pace. But even the calm well, Finn was well, finding well, that well, stopping well, the heavy well, production well, class well, cars well, was a challenge. In contrast, Justin Dale was reveling in the light, agile and forgiving handling of his Peugeot 106. cc car was still within two minutes of the rally leader and heading the four-car scrap for the Ferodo Super 1600 honours. 
Teammate David Higgins, the younger brother of the rally leader, was still second in class and sixth overall. But behind him, it was turning into a fantastic battle for third place. The all-new Ford Puma, driven by the experienced Martin Rowe, was on what was basically a development exercise for the Ford team. Collecting data and comparing times with the opposition, yet it was trading the seconds with a flying Citroën Saxo of Neil McShay. McShay's privateer team have a fraction of the resources of Ford or Peugeot, so how were they matching their pace? I've been trying absolutely everything I know today, um, pushing maybe a little too hard in places, having a few lockups, but I wouldn't say we're really losing much time by them. And to be honest, I'm a little afraid if I try to drive a little neater, Mike, we might end up losing a lot of time, you know, so I think I'll just stick it to flat out and see what happens, please. <laughs> But David Higgins' Peugeot was now a late arrival in service, losing vital time and that second in class. We're on the start line, the fuel pumps are getting noisy, and the lift um, pump fuse went, but we tried everything, and I just swapped all the fuses around the dashboard, and the thing fired up, so... How many minutes? I haven't even thought. 15, I would say, at least. Um, the thing is, now we're, we're looking forward to a bit of a... to try and have a bit of a, a go against Justin this evening, but this just really capped it, but I'm sure there'll be more problems for other people tonight. So, from now on in, it's a test of development exercise? Yeah, character-building exercise as well, isn't it? The final loop of six special stages, starting at midnight, finishing at 7am, will be the final sting in the tail. And the first victim will be the 1600 class leader, Justin Dale, with hammering noises coming from a broken drive shaft. And that was just the start. Look under the car. Flames. It's on fire, isn't it? It's on fire. Right, hit the... Quick! Leave a bonnet, Doom. Leave a bonnet, you know. Quick thinking by Dale, leaving the car on the road would stop it setting the grass alight too. Meanwhile, Neil Simpson, thinking the Peugeot had just blown an engine, squeezed through. We've got another extinguisher. Right, that's it's it. Still it's on fire. It's still on fire. It's still on fire. <coughs> Don't push it on the grass. No, just leave it there. Right, one squarely up, grab up. But Neil Weirden, who used to be a professional fireman, was quick to recognise the signs, and he reverted to his former profession. The combined teamwork of the Vauxhall and Peugeot crews, as well as the marshals, had kept the damage to a minimum, in contrast to Milner's car earlier in the event. As a result of the dramas, the times for the stage will be cancelled. But little consolation, though, for Dale and co-driver Andrew Bardry, whose rally was over. They could only consider the loss of a dominant class victory. Um, about a quarter of a mile before the junction there, we've just come round them bells, uh, uh, come into a square left and the shaft broke, uh, the front drive shaft, left side, and uh, then all, the oil's come out of the box, obviously, and just set fire to it on the... Um, the, bottom, the manifold goes right the way underneath the engine there, so it's just set fire to all that, and the whole engine bay went up. Even with both Peugeots gone, the battle in the 1600 class was far from over. <laughs> McShay in the Citroën was now the class leader, but by just two seconds from Rowe in the Ford. Then on the next stage, the Ford Puma was on its own. The Saxo's engine had wilted under McShay's unyielding right foot, leaving Rowe in sixth overall, the Super 1600 class leader. Here we are leading the class. We came up to do some testing, and on the last service, we changed the gearbox, and uh, you know we weren't sure if the car was going to be faster or slower, and we were hoping to gauge against the other class, cars in the class to see you know, if we made any gains, and they've all gone, so uh, it's good. Among the leading two-litre cars, Tapio Laukana was now back up to second place and closing on leader Higgins. But the Volkswagen driver had a final scare to come. Hey. 
ja vasen K. 300. Thankfully the marshal rolled with the punch and was unhurt, but it was proof if ever be needed that no one can Let's ever go. relax their vigilance on a rally stage. Moken and obviously a little shaken, at least could see the marshal was back on his feet as he restarted the stage. And it says plenty for the Finns' powers of concentration that he was obviously back on the pace a few miles later. Despite using all his driving skill and some experimental tyres handmade in Korea, Yama Kutaleto was now fighting to hold on to third place. It was made even tougher when the battery started to lose charge. We had the problem on stage and uh, we lost the coordinator. And uh, after the stage, we had the big problems to get here. So you've got 20 minutes in service now. Do you think you'll be able to fix it? Yes, I think so. It's, it's, we, we can change the alternator or the, or the cable or whatever. The fast-moving Hyundai mechanics got Kutaleto into action on time, but the Finn was now under real pressure from the Astra of Neil Weirden, which had fought its way back up the order from 12th place. The Lancastrian and the second-place Laukonen had shared the fastest times on every one of the overnight stages. And as dawn began to break, the two Vauxhalls were now sandwiching the Volkswagen in first and third places. Laukonen, though, had one last ace to gamble. 23 seconds behind the leader onto the final special stage. Despite fine drizzle, he chanced running on lightly treaded dry weather tyres. If the roads stayed relatively dry, he could still win the event. But that 90 miles an hour slide showed the gamble had been lost. After that, he dropped his pace and was prepared to settle for second. Not that Mark Higgins and Brian Thomas knew that, of course. They'd selected the more heavily treaded intermediate tyres, but they couldn't know how fast Laukonen would go. Their only option was to drive the final stage absolutely flat out in treacherous conditions. 17, right, fine. 100, stop. Bloody hell, That's horrendous, isn't it? Well done, mate. I think that's enough. Yeah, I hope it's enough. It deserves to be enough. It was indeed, but after 155 competitive miles, the result had been in doubt to the 24th and last special stage, with Higgins and Thomas taking the victory by just 27 seconds. It's uh, been quite a difficult rally, really. The pace has been very hot all the way through, and uh, with other people made mistakes, we sort of capitalised on that, and then it was very difficult to try and maintain, you know, the lead we had, and we've done that, and it's been... it's gone to plan. <laughs> In the Drivers' Championship, Higgins' win moves him to within three points of Marco Epati, who finished eighth. We get uh, five points now, and, and that keeps our, our position still in the lead. We think about still what we are doing and what car we are using. I think it's MSA Rally we are using our lines, so let's see what happens in Ireland. Man. And while New Boys Hyundai still hold their lead in the Manufacturers' Championship, there are just two points in it between themselves and Vauxhall, with two championship rounds left.